There was quite a lot to cover in the second half of chapter 13. I would start with the basic functions of all of the brain regions that we covered. We also covered a number of very important concepts, one of which was memory. We discussed the difference between short-term and long-term memory, the difference between motor memory versus factual memory, and we discussed how the hippocampus, with the help of some other basal ganglia, could consolidate memories. We also discussed decision-making and how Phineas Gage was not a good example of scientific deduction. We talked about drug addiction and covered the functions of the VTA and nucleus accumbens. And we also discussed the blood-brain barrier, which wasn't a structure in the brain, but a system of interconnected tight junctions between endothelial cells and astrocytes. Short-term memory can be stored in the prefrontal cortex. There is only enough room to store about four or five pieces of information at any one time. That's because this type of memory requires constant electrical stimulation of neurons. For a more long-term solution, the hippocampus is able to consolidate these short-term memories into long-term memories. Which short-term memories get consolidated requires some help from other emotional centers, such as the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens, which are responsible for pleasure, and the amygdala, which is responsible for fear. Because the hippocampus, amygdala, and nucleus accumbens are all basal ganglia, or subcortical structures, these are subconscious activities, which is why we do not have more conscious control over what memories we are able to store or not. The memories are stored out in the cortex, hence we are able to consciously remember them. However, the hippocampus, when we say it consolidates memory, does not mean that it stores memory. It just converts short-term memories into long-term memories. Factual memories require both repetition and context, whereas motor memories do not require context. These types of memories do not involve the hippocampus and involve the cerebellum, the post and precentral gyrus, and the striatum. During learning and memory, there can be a number of changes to the connections between neurons, which increase the strength of their synapses. If we zoom in, one of the first changes that can come with repeated stimulation is chemical. Activation of neurotransmitter receptors may activate second messengers, which activate enzymes, which will feed back and phosphorylate the receptors, making them stronger at creating graded potentials. A more long-term change can be an increase in the amount of neurotransmitter-filled vesicles from the presynaptic neuron and an increase in the number of neurotransmitter receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. These two types of changes are a little bit longer lasting than the enzymatic changes. The longest lasting type of memory involves structural changes to these cells. The presynaptic neuron can grow more axon terminals and the postsynaptic cell can grow more dendritic spines. This increases the number of synapses between these two cells, so that when the first cell fires an action potential, a significantly increased amount of neurotransmitter is released, causing a much bigger graded potential on the postsynaptic cell. One of the questions in the study guide asks, what parts of the brain would you use to get up and walk over to the refrigerator? This question is way too open-ended to actually put on an exam, but it'll cover a number of the brain regions that will be on your test. Conscious movement of the body reflects activity in the pre-central gyrus. To begin a motion, however, we rely on the function of the substantia nigra in the midbrain. Coordinated body movements, such as walking, involves activity in the cerebellum.
the cerebellum will be coordinating motor control with sensory information coming from the body. Proprioceptors and touch receptors can signal up to the thalamus to the primary sensory cortex and the cerebellum will match this with the muscle information that it is sending out. If we are watching where we're going, that will reflect activity in the occipital lobe. And if we remember where the refrigerator is, those memories are stored throughout the cortex. And if I'm trying to decide what I want out of the fridge, decision making reflects activity in the prefrontal cortex. And lastly, we should mention that if we're hungry, that reflects activity in the hypothalamus. One of our most common medications in the treatment of depression is a class of drugs known as an SSRI, or a serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor. It's important to understand the pattern of why we would want to block the reuptake of serotonin rather than boost serotonin levels directly. First off, when serotonin is released from a synapse, it can bind to serotonin receptors on the postsynaptic cell. That serotonin is removed from the synaptic cleft fairly quickly by the reuptake protein. This is the protein that is inhibited by the SSRI. With this drug on board, as serotonin gets released from the presynaptic cell, it does not get removed as quickly and therefore builds up in the synapse increasing the strength of the serotonin signal. There are other drugs which can mimic serotonin, such as LSD. Why don't we use these drugs if what we are after is increased serotonin signaling? That's because LSD or other drugs that mimic serotonin would activate every synapse that has serotonergic receptors, whereas an SSRI merely boosts serotonin levels in synapses that happen to be firing serotonin at that time. We saw the same pattern last quarter when we discussed the use of cholinesterase inhibitors in the treatment of myasthenia gravis. A cholinesterase inhibitor inhibits the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine after it's released into a synapse, rather than its reuptake. One more common pattern that we saw last quarter that is still very relevant today is that if we bombard any of these synapses with chemicals that mimic neurotransmitters, this usually leads to the down regulation of receptor numbers. This leads to tolerance to that chemical or drug. In fact, the serotonin theory of depression had to be updated once it was pointed out that SSRIs could increase serotonin levels the very next day, but that the drugs didn't have therapeutic effects for about a month. The theory was updated to suggest that the mechanism of action was increasing serotonin that ultimately led to a down-regulation of serotonin receptors. There's a much better theory for depression, and that is called the neurogenesis theory which suggests that it's a lack of growth of neurons in certain parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, that leads to depression. Altering neurotransmitter levels may mask the underlying defect of not enough neurons or not enough dendritic spines on the neurons, but the root cause could be growth rather than neurotransmitter levels. When we discussed deeper brain regions, like the thalamus or medulla oblongata, we did not discuss the difference between the left and the right sides, as there was no difference, except perhaps to which side of the body they're connected to. On the other hand, the cortex was special. Here we had something called hemispheric lateralization, which means that either side of the cerebral hemispheres has a different task from the other one. For instance, language and math tended to be functions carried out by the left cerebral hemisphere, whereas facial recognition and spatial orientation were carried out by the right hemisphere. Language was fairly complicated in that we did not have just one area dedicated to it, and instead we have a hodgepodge of several places. The part of the brain that coordinates the motor function of language 
is, not surprisingly, located more anteriorly. Whereas the part that's more involved in the sensation of language and the ability to put words together in a correct format is located more posteriorly. This is not surprising because, just like the spine, motor information tended to be more ventral and sensory information more dorsal. The precentral gyrus is our primary motor cortex. This is responsible for conscious movement of the body, whereas the postcentral gyrus was our primary sensory cortex. Activity here reflects when we feel something happening in one part of our body. These two areas have maps of the human body. Remember that a more sensitive area takes up more space in the brain, so this map is not uniform, but distorted. Highly sensitive areas like the lips and fingertips take up a lot more space than the elbows. Similarly, regions of the body that we have a lot of coordination over, the lips and the fingers, take up a lot more space in the precentral gyrus than the elbows. One major difference between these two is that the teeth and the genitalia are both very sensitive and therefore take up some region of the postcentral gyrus, but we have little to no muscle control over them. Therefore, we do not have brain space dedicated to them in the precentral gyrus.